Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday, and welcome to South Peoria Baptist Church. In a few moments, Pastor Anthony is going to lead us in worship, and Pastor Jeremiah will bring the message as we continue to study the book of Romans. If this is your first time visiting, welcome. We're so happy that you were able to join us today. If you have any questions, please let us know. You can also pick up one of our bulletins. It's got information about our church, contact information, a list of events, all the things going on at South Peoria, so you want to pick up one of those. You'll also want to pick up a Sermon Notes handout. Pastor Jeremiah is going to bring the message, and there's a lot of fill in the blanks, uh, so please be sure to take the notes, and you can also refer to them throughout the week. We've got life group questions on there, and we've also got tools for life that you can discuss with your family during the week. We're so glad you're able to join us today. If you have any questions about South Peoria, please be sure to check out our bulletin, stop by our welcome desk, check us out online, or stop and talk to one of us. We hope you enjoyed the services. Have a great week. Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Anthony. I'm the associate pastor and the worship leader here at South Peoria. We are glad you're here this morning. When you walked in, hopefully you got a bulletin. If you're a guest with us today, welcome. We are glad you uh, chose to come here this morning, this cold morning, <laughs> but hopefully uh, when you grab the bulletin, you can fill out the communication card and you can actually tear it out and put it in the offering plate later on in the service or you can bring it to our welcome desk and we have a gift for you. On the back of uh, the bulletin, there are a few different things going on. Our church is hosting the Women's Carried event this Saturday. So we have over 100 uh, women already registered. So if you haven't registered, you can still register. Uh, it is this Saturday. It's going to be here in this building. Uh, so please make sure you're a part of that. Invite the women in your life, uh, neighbors, family, friends, um, and make sure you're a part of that. So women from all over Arizona are gonna be coming here this Saturday. Also, we have a women's life group on uh, Monday nights at seven. So if you'd like more information, you can see uh, Renee Hull, or you can uh, put some information down on the uh, communication card. And if you're not plugged into a life group yet, it is an opportunity for you to go deeper into the sermon. So as Pastor Jeremiah brings the word, we can not only take notes, but we have life group questions on your note sheet, and there's tools for life. Because sometimes we listen to a sermon and we think, okay, how does this apply? Or how can I take this and really apply it to my life? We've given you a, uh, tools as a church to live out God's word. So hopefully you have one of those. And also, if you are a parent of a child or no parents of children, there is a children's parent meeting right after second service today. And lunch is provided. And so Michelle Puente, our children's director, is going to be leading that. Uh, because here at South Peoria, we believe the best gift we can give a child is a healthy mom and dad. And so please make sure you're a part of that after second service. But if you'll stand with me, church, we're going to start off this morning with prayer. God, we thank you for a wonderful morning that we can come here and worship you. We pray that you are honored and you are glorified. We pray that as we dive into your word that you will speak clearly to us, God. May our ears be open to what you have to say. May our hearts receive what you have to say, God. May we be stirred and may we be changed because of your spirit. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And we thank you that we don't have to earn your love, Lord. You have given it to us freely. Yet we pray in this morning that we can truly understand the depth of of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and take this moment and welcome those around you.
this out together, church. Tis the grandest theme through the ages run. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world ever sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or main. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme, tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme, let the tiding roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee, though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn open to the book of Romans, chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's a blue New Testament in the seat pocket in front of you. You can grab that and turn open to Romans, chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1 this morning. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered this matter? And if, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness. Verse four. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Verse 7, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, many of us have attempted to try and please you by the things we think are good, the things we think are godly. And as going through Romans, we see that no one is righteous, no one does good, no one seeks you, God. We know it is by your spirit that we are drawn to you. But Lord, this morning, many of us think that our good works, our good things, earn your love, that we deserve your love. But Lord, your love is given freely. And in your grace and in your mercy, you've given us the ability and the gift to have faith in you. Show us that it is not by our good things that we are saved, but it is truly by faith, knowing who you are and praising you for what you've done. Let us continue to praise you, God, and only you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing this out together. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing soul. My God, like you there is no other. 
true delight is found in you alone. Your grace, a well too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heavens reach. Your truth, a fount of perfect wisdom. My highest good and my unending need. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, strong defender of my weary heart, my sword. To fight the cruel deceiver And my shield against his hateful darts My song, my song When enemies surround me My hope when times of sorrow rise My joy when trials are in the night Oh Lord my rock and my redeemer gracious Savior of my ruined life my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders in my place you suffered bled and died you rose the grave and death are conquered you broke my bonds of sin and shame you rose you rose the grave and death are conquered of sin and shame oh lord my rock and my redeemer may all my days bring glory to your name may all my days bring glory to your we can delight in you. God, and once again, it is only by your grace and your mercy that we can truly delight in you and have faith in you, God. May we come to an understanding this morning that it is not by us that we are saved and justified and made righteous, but it is only by you. Jesus, may you be glorified this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. God is good. Amen. And all the time? Amen. Well, I am excited as we continue in Romans chapter 4 and verse 1 today. And a couple of quick things I just want to go over. I'm really excited about going on in the life of our church. Today, right after our second service, we have our, our, our monthly, every other month, we have a parents meeting for parents of children or grandparents or guardians of children. And our children's minister, uh, Michelle Puente, meets with parents. We have a lunch provided. There will be pizza there. It's open to anybody that wants to come. And we equip parents or grandparents or guardians in how to raise their children in a biblical life. And so today, Michelle is going to be looking at uh, things going on in our culture and how to deal with anger in our children. And so it's a really powerful time. I encourage you to be a part of that. If you're a grandparent or a parent or you have any kind of spiritual influence in a child's life, come out and spend some time with us for lunch. Today we'll be in building for right on the back of our property. Also, starting next Sunday, we have our next SP, SPU class, our South Peoria University class, and we are doing the Introduction to Theology. And so there'll be an eight-week class going through the Introduction to Theology. And theology often gets a bad name. 
and people think it's over my head, or that's, that should be left up to the pastors, or the preachers, or the theologians, or the seminary professors. And the truth is, everybody's a theologian. Look at the person next to you and go, I didn't realize you were a theologian. I didn't realize you were that smart. <laughs> Everybody is a theologian. Because a theologian is somebody who studies God. And so if you have an idea, a thought or, or about who God is, that makes you a theologian. And so now that we know that everybody's a theologian, the question really is, are you a good one or a bad one? That's really what the question is. And so as we go through the introduction of theology, it gives us the basis and how we can study God. And so I encourage you, sign up for that today on the communication card. It will be on Sunday evening starting next Sunday for eight weeks. And we'll have a good time as we come together and we talk about some of the basic doctrines and theology found in Scripture. And so it will be a good time to come together. Well, speaking of theology, we are going through the book of Romans, which is one of the, the deepest theological books in the New Testament. It's a powerful book. And I warned us before we started going through Romans that Romans will wreck us. And because it will, it will challenge what we think and what we feel, what we believe, what we do, because we all need to grow more in our faith, it, there's always more to discover about God. But as we go through Romans, it will butt up against some things that we thought about God or that we, that we believe about God or how we live our life that we look into Scripture and realize we thought incorrectly, we felt incorrectly, we believed incorrectly, or we're behaving incorrectly according to God's Word. And so that comes to the need of repentance in our life. And the point of repentance is for us to realize we are wrong. And we don't have the power in and of ourselves to be right. And so we ask God, we say, please forgive me for thinking or feeling or believing or acting wrong. But give me the strength, the supernatural strength from the Spirit to be able to begin to think right, to feel right, and to do right. And so we went, we were going through this journey in Romans. And so it should challenge you. And you should see some things in here that challenge you and butt up against your faith and challenge you to think differently about Scripture and about God. And so we began in this journey in, Ch in Romans chapter 1, and Paul introduced himself to the church at Rome and said, hey, I am Paul. You've heard about me. I've heard about you. I hope to come visit you and introduce myself. I want to preach with you and lead other people and share the gospel with you so we can sharpen each other up. And in case you didn't know it, in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation to all who believe, first to the Jew and the Gentile. So Paul takes the opportunity in Romans, after years of being a missionary, to give us the most exhaustive explanation of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and here is what it is. And so we learned that first week, that we have to believe the whole gospel or we believe a false gospel. We don't have a luxury of just picking and choosing the things we like, but we have to take a look at what God's word really says about the gospel. We believe the whole gospel or we believe a false gospel. And so Paul spent the, the remaining parts of that first chapter and the second chapter and most of the third chapter explaining to us that the wicked people of this world are guilty. All those evil pe people out there are without excuse. They're guilty. They're guilty of sin. And then all of the moral people said, yeah, all those evil people are guilty. And then Paul says, and then all the moral people are guilty. And all the religious people are like, we've been trying to tell them that. And then Paul says, no, you missed it. Everyone is guilty. Even the religious people are guilty. And he tells us, for everyone has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. And they said, well, what about the law? We have the law. That makes us right with God, right? And Paul said, no. And last week we got into the good news and a powerful statement was made. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. That's the good news. The law shows us that we're sinners. It doesn't save us. It's a mirror to show us that we are dirty, but it doesn't wash us clean. But apart from the law, there's hope in Jesus Christ. His righteousness can become ours. And so Paul continues for us today. Paul continues for us today into chapter 4, and, and as we look at this, uh, Brian, I think we got a different one up there. If you'll go to Romans, got it. Awesome. Thank you. So we look at today, we're going to go into Romans chapter 4, verse 1, and it begins like this. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? So Paul has said, apart from the law, 
the righteousness of God has been made known through Jesus Christ. So what should we say? What do we really know about this? And I want to go back real quick. Verse 22 says this righteousness is given through faith. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So as you're taking notes today, he says there's a justification apart from the law that makes us right with God. How do we get justified apart from the law? What's the only way we can be justified? And write this down, the first blank. How are we justified? Sola fide, by faith alone. This is a historical term here, sola fide. It literally means by faith alone. This is one of the terms that sparked the Reformation, that brought us back to faith alone, but to Scripture alone, to Christ alone, to grace alone. And this idea that there is no other justification apart from faith alone. How are we justified by faith alone? And so here's the, term, here's the problem with this, though. That makes you and I very uncomfortable. In fact, as you take notes, you need to write this down. Mankind, all of us, mankind is hostile to the idea that justification comes from faith alone. We are hostile to it. We fight back violently against the idea that we can be made right with God through faith alone. And the reason we fight back against that is because the deepest offense is spoken through that, which says, you are not good enough. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not good enough. And then respond, well, neither are you. Everyone is sinned and falls short of the glory of God. And you think about that. It's built when we understand that righteousness comes by faith alone. Justification comes by faith alone. What we are ultimately saying is in you and in me, there is nothing that can make us right with God. No matter what good we do, there is nothing. I cannot be good enough on my own. And this idea of good, this idea of I'm a decent person. How, who are you to tell me that I am not good enough? And that's a good question. And I just want to repeat what we, what we saw at the end of chapter 3 in verse 10. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Justification comes from faith alone. It reinforces the truth that there is no one that can be made right with God from anything they have on their own. That goes against our very core belief of who we are, that I can do it. And we need to have something we can hold on to that goes, look how hard I worked. Look at the good things I did. There's an old preacher story about a frog. My brother once gave me a stuffed frog from Honduras, this big, ugly brown frog. He brought it back. I think he smuggled it into the country because it's an animal. I'm not sure you could bring it back across borders. But it's dead and stuffed. And it's an ugly frog. But there's a story about an ugly frog who's hopping along one day, and he falls into a bucket, a five-gallon bucket of milk. And this frog is used to being in liquid. You know, he can swim, and they're amphibious, and all this, all this about frogs. But this frog really soon realizes in this five-gallon bucket of milk, he's in a very bad situation. That while he's amphibious, he still breathes air. And there's no way out of this bucket of milk. And so he tries what we would try. He tries to sink down to the bottom in order to get enough energy by touching the bottom of the bucket and then jumping out but there's too much milk in this five gallon bucket of milk in order for him to get enough inertia to jump out of this bucket. So he's stuck in the bucket. And so he does what every, every one of us would do if we were a frog trapped in a five gallon of milk, five gallon bucket of milk, he begins to tread milk, trying to stay alive, hoping, hoping at some point somebody will come along and see him struggling to stay alive, drowning in the five gallon bucket of milk. Well, some time goes by, right? And he's sitting there and he is just trying to stay afloat, stay afloat, stay afloat, stay afloat, and he is just treading water as fast, or treading milk as fast as he can to stay alive. Well, milk is different than water, isn't it? 
And if you churn milk long enough, what happens? Turns to butter. So this frog, in his own ability, without even knowing it, is able to churn, to tread that milk long enough that there's some kind of thickness, some kind of, of solidness that churns from that milk into butter to give him enough of a foundation for him to jump out of the bucket. And at the heart of every single one of us, we want to believe we're that frog and there's something we can do that will get us out of the bucket of sin of life. And the truth is, we're not in milk. There's nothing that gets us out of the bucket that we're stuck in. And there's nothing we have inside of us that's going to happen. And God's word says very clearly, very clearly, it's by faith alone. And now Paul brings us to probably the two most prominent, two of the most prominent figures in Jewish history to explain what they found out about faith. And so he introduces the concept of Abraham and the concept of David for us. And so he tells us in, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, so what did Abraham find out about this? What did Abraham, our father Abraham, discover about faith? What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Verse 2, in fact, if Abraham was justified by works, if he was a frog that was able to churn butter, he had something to boast about. If that frog made it out of that bucket, he had a story for his friends to hear about, didn't he? Look, you'll never guess what I did today. I did such a good job when I came out of there, that was sweet cream butter left in there, right? Right? Abraham would have had something to boast about if he could have came across salvation, justification on his own. But Paul says, no. He would have had something to boast about. He would have had something to brag about. But not before God. So what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is a direct quote out of the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. When we're introduced to Abraham, and God had called him out of the land of Ur, out of the land of the Chaldeans, and told him to, to leave everything that of his family behind, to pack everything he had up, and to go into the land that he would show him. And then God came to Abraham in his old age, and Abraham says, God, I don't know what you're doing here. But look, you haven't even blessed me with the son, and now I'm past the point where me and my wife can have children, which means that whatever it is that you're going to bless me with is actually going to be passed down to somebody who's not even part, somebody who's not even part of my family is going to get everything that I've worked for. God, what are you doing? And God says, Abraham, that's not going to happen. I'm going to bless you with a son. I'm going to give you an heir. And the very next verse in verse 6 it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness it was counted to him as righteousness now I think about that we find out faith is a gift from God salvation is a gift from God justification even the ability for Abraham to believe and we're going to get more into this next week as we dive into Abraham's faith but faith itself is a gift from God and the idea that Abraham was able to have that faith, it's a gift from God. So the only thing that makes us right, this, this miraculous arrangement by which a radical, corrupt sinner can be made right in the eyes of God comes by faith alone. Faith in Jesus Christ, and it's available to anyone who will believe it. And this is the powerful thing when we understand that Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the physical presence of God the Father on earth. That the one that would have been met with Abraham and sat there with Abraham was Christ before he came in the form of a child at Christmas. And we see that Abraham's faith as he spent time with the Lord. And you look in your Bible there, if you go back and do the research, chapter 15, verse 6, it says, the Lord. And that is capital L and capital O-R-D. It is actually the, the proper name of God. It is Yahweh. And that would have been Christ before Christmas. And it says, Abraham believed him and it was counted to him as righteousness. And this is what we get from this. Faith 
is the only currency that can be used to receive credit, the credit of righteousness. Think about that. In order for us to get the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we have to exchange something for that credit. When I was a kid in junior high, in the early 90s, the, the height of the arcade had died. And video games, and the mall that, that was down at the end of our street had begun to die, and the arcade had closed down. And I would go every morning on the way to school. My dad would actually, the school was close to the church that my, my dad worked at. So he would drive me to church, and I'd get out of the car at church, and he'd give me $2 for lunch every day. And so on the way to my junior high, I'd walk across the street, and there was Circle K. And back in the day, Circle K had arcade games. And this Circle K had my favorite arcade game. And so I would take that $2 that I had for lunch, and I'd walk up to the counter and ask for $2 and change. $2 and change, and I would waste my lunch money. I would waste my lunch money on my favorite arcade game. And there was always a group of us kids hanging around this arcade. It was Street Fighter II. It was a fighting game. And I would take my quarter in there, some of you are laughing, some of you know what I'm talking about. I would take my quarter and I'd drop it in the slot. And on the screen in front of me, it would pop up and say, one credit. One credit. I have exchanged what I have for the ability to receive a credit to do what I want to do, to be able to play my favorite game. There is a spiritual component to this in the fact that for us to be made right with faith, by faith alone in Christ Jesus for anyone who would believe, there is nothing in and of ourselves that can bring us to that miraculous arrangement where we're, be, where we're able to be made right with God. We get the credit for something somebody else has done. We get some, the credit of somebody else's righteousness. In fact, we call this the great exchange. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange. The quarter that we have that gives us the credit of righteousness is faith. And that doesn't even belong to us. It's a gift from God. He steps down and gives us the very thing that we need to, do, we need to have in order to exchange for the credit of his righteousness. And so this miraculous arrangement, the only way that ungodly people, that's everyone who's ever lived, the only way that ungodly can be made justified is by being credited with Christ's righteousness. So there's an exchange that happens there we see in 2 Corinthians 5. That we've been given this faith and we exchange, that's the exchange that happens there. Through the faith, he takes on our sin and we get his righteousness. This is a powerful thought that can only come through faith alone. So it tells us in verse 3, what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. But he says, now to the one who works, wages are not credited. They're not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. If we could be like that frog and somehow have something to do with our salvation, it is no longer a gift but God is now obligated to us. And that will mess with your understanding of God if you think the creator of the universe is in some way obligated to you. Think about that. There is, we've gone over this before, but God is in no way obligated to any of his creation. But in his mercy and his kindness, he chooses to love us and chose to die for us. He is not obligated, but his love is much greater than obligation. See, verse five continues, however, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. This is what we're hostile against in our nature. 
is we want to think there is something inside of us that makes us worthy of salvation. We want to think there's something inside of us that can earn the righteousness at least part way, some way, deserve, earn, that if I have this, there's some kind of intrinsic, intrinsic value inside of me that makes me worthy of salvation. And that some way, there is an obligation from God that because of that intrinsic value of something that I've achieved or earned or thought, or I'm not as bad as that guy is, that God is obligated to save me because I'm a pretty good guy. And Paul says, no, you will fall short and that frog is going to drown. But to anyone who will believe, faith, through faith, salvation and justification is available to anyone. But we want to have this idea that maybe it's attached to our good works, our good deeds. And this gets twisted so bad in Christianity and, 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 and belief that we think that it's got to be faith and. Like we got to have faith in Jesus and do good things. We got to have faith in Jesus and go to church. We got to have faith in Jesus and be a decent person. But anytime we use the word and after faith, we have totally twisted and distorted what the gospel is. Gospel justification comes by faith alone. And we need to right side, right side our mind with this so we could think correctly on this. In my parents' backyard, there's this orange, orange tree. They live in Sun City. I think there's an orange tree in every backyard in Sun City. But there's this beautiful orange tree, and we were over at my parents' house this week for dinner on Friday, and we had ate on the back porch. It was a beautiful night, and every time we, we they have a beautiful backyard, every time we eat out there, at some point in time, the orange tree becomes the topic of conversation. And so my kids love this orange tree. They help pull the, or the oranges off or pick the oranges up off the ground, and they help take care of the orange tree. And one of my kids was talking about the orange tree, and I started looking at this orange tree, and I realized if that orange tree never had a single orange on it, you know what it would be? An orange tree. It would still be an orange tree because that is what it is. The oranges do not make it an orange tree. It's an orange tree because it is an orange tree. Because it is an orange tree, and it's a good orange tree, it bears oranges. It'll never bear apples or pears or grapefruit. It will only bear oranges because that is what it is. We like to look at our lives and think the oranges make us a Christian. That's what makes us, is our works, our earning it. Something about us, something that we produce is what makes us what it is. And it tells us, no, we are justified by faith and we become a new creation. Created in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. And we are a new creation born to a new life. And the works that come through the Spirit to bring glory to God are the work of God himself. And those fruits that bear in us because we are Christians are not what make us a Christian. The fruit that we bear because God is in us is not what makes us right with God. We've got it backwards and put the horse or the cart before the horse. When we become a new creation in Christ through faith alone, we are a Christian because that's what faith has made us, not our fruit. Not the orange tree, it will always, even if it never bared an orange, it would still be an orange tree because that is what God made it. You couldn't change it at its core. So he tells us, to the one who does not, the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And then he introduces, now he's told us Abraham has figured this out. Your father Abraham figured out his righteousness came through faith, not through the good things he did, but through faith. Now he introduces us to King David, and he says this about King David. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. God credits righteousness apart from works, apart from the law. I want to go back to King David for a moment before I read this next. You see, this is a direct quote out of Psalms 32, what we're about to read. But there's some context needed for us to read this. 
King David was guilty of doing some very horrendous things. And there's some things we know about King David. And if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. Of one of the one of the greatest leaders of the na- history in the na- in the history of the nation of Israel is King David. David was guilty of adultery and murder, for which there is no atonement. The penalty was death. King David, as the leader of Israel, was guilty of adultery and murder. And according to the law, there is no atonement. There is just death. So this is interesting. The short story of this, we know if you have any understanding of the background of David's, he was at the wrong place. He chose to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. It was the time when kings were supposed to be at war and David decided to take the season off. And he fell into temptation, had an affair, and to cover up the affair because the woman became pregnant, to cover up the affair, he had it was one of his top general's wives, he had his top general killed. And so now he's guilty of, of the adultery and murder. And so along comes Nathan. Nathan's an interesting character in the Old Testament. He's a prophet. And he comes to King David, which is, is uh, the prophets had one of the unique abilities to come into the presence of the king and put their fingers in their faces. So Nathan comes into the presence of King David and tells David a story. It's a powerful story. He says, King David, can I tell you a story? And David's like, absolutely. See, well, there was this man. He was a poor man, and all he had was a little lamb, right? And he loved that little lamb. That's all he had. And so he fed the lamb. The lamb slept in his house. He took care of this lamb. It was all this poor man had. One day, his rich neighbor had a friend come over, a visitor. And the rich neighbor looked out over all of his land and all of his lambs and all of his livestock and said, you know what, I don't want to kill one of mine, but I see, my, I see this little lamb over here that belongs to my poor neighbor, and that's all he has. And he commanded one of, his gar- one of his men to go out, take the poor man's lamb, slaughter the lamb, and make a feast out of it. This would be the equivalent of somebody barbecuing your dog this evening. That is a horrendous thing to do. And so David hears this story, and it says in 2 Samuel that David became angry. He became overcome with anger and outrage towards the rich man in this story. Towards the rich man in this story. And Nathan's like, what's the problem? And David says, don't you see that that rich man took everything that the only thing and everything that the poor man had, destroyed the poor man's life, and wasn't even repentant of it. And Nathan says, yeah, I do. And David said, that man deserves death. And Nathan says, yes, he does. And that man is you. And David instantly knew what was going on, what he thought was hidden from God, what he thought was hidden from everybody else. And he fell to his knees in repentance. I have sinned against God. I have sinned and I have done a horrendous thing. And Nathan's response is interesting. Nathan goes through and goes, yes, you have, David. You've messed up. And there's going to be some major consequences in this. Your family is going to suffer because of the sin you've brought in has caused dysfunction. And there's going to be some things that will never leave you. The sword will never leave your house because of the chaos you've brought in. This is going to have, this are going to have ramifications that goes on for generations. But there's an interesting thing. In 2 Samuel 2, 12, 13, Nathan says this. David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. See, David knew in that moment that God had every right, according to the law, to strike him dead, and he expected it. Found guilty before the nation of Israel, before the law of God and God himself, of adultery and murder. There is no atonement in the law for for murder or adultery. The consequence is death. But then Nathan says, God has taken away your sin, and you will not die. And then we get a quote here in Romans, 
of David after this has happened. And this is the context to which we read these next verses. Verse 6, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, and blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. David knew nothing that he had done would ever be enough. And he knew he fell far short of the glory of God that he himself deserved death. And he says, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions will never be held against them, whose sins the Lord will never count against them. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. The miraculous arrangement in which a radically corrupt sinner could stand before the throne of God and his sins will not be held against him it comes through justification by faith alone. Not by works, but by faith alone. So the question I have for us today in this room, the question and the most important question, when it comes time to stand before the king, Will your sins be counted against you? Or have you received the credit of Christ's righteousness and been made right through a miraculous arrangement that he took your sin and you received the righteousness of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come into your presence today. And we deal with this concept that really does struggle with the heart of mankind. There is no good in us. And compared to your righteousness, we fall far short. And it strikes a bad chord with us when we think there's nothing inside of us that can make us good enough that we could have any, even the littlest bit to do with salvation. We all wish we could be like that frog, that there would be some kind of intrinsic value inside of us that would make us earn even just the smallest amount that would make us worthy. But God, you are so good that even though we fall far short of your glory, you have made a way for us apart from the law, apart from us trying to earn it, apart from good works, but it comes through faith alone. In Jesus Christ and it's available to anyone who would believe that even the most radical of sinners can be made right in the eyes of God through what Christ has done for us as we continue praying I encourage you here today church to examine your hearts and examine your life you may be here today and you may be understanding this idea of who Jesus is for the very first time You know in your life that we fall so short of God's glory. All of us are sinners. It doesn't matter how good we think we are. We all have fallen short. And we miss the mark. But Christ in his goodness paid the price for each and every one of us so that we could receive a free gift of faith that makes us right with God. If you're here today and you've been trying to make it on your own, I want to tell you, stop. You can let go of that. There's no need. It's the stress and the tension and the pressure in your life to think that you have to do something to earn it. It's just a lie of the evil one to tear you down. But it's a free gift that comes from Christ alone. Faith alone in Christ. And so if you're here today and you want to receive that free gift of Christ, that free gift of faith. We'll see later in Romans, it tells us if we believe in our hearts and confess in our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. We will be forgiven and blessed is the one whose sins are not held against them when it comes to standing before God. 
and that you can be just like King David no matter what you've done, no matter what you deserve. What you get is the grace and mercy through the love of Christ. I'm going to encourage you here in just a moment. If you want to receive that free gift, forgiveness, that free gift of life, that free gift of belief in Jesus Christ, I'm going to encourage you to come down as we sing our next song. It's a song of response. I encourage you to come down and, and you can speak with me or one of our other leaders will be standing down here in the front and we'll show you how you can receive that gift today. And I encourage you to be bold in that and come and speak with one of us. And it may be here that you're a believer today and it's just... Even after we receive that free gift, we often get caught up in the disillusionment that it's about what we do and trying to measure up, and that's not true. You see, as we become a believer, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and it's the Holy Spirit that works through us. So any fruit that we do bear comes from the Spirit. If we try to measure our fruit, we always feel like we don't measure up. And so it just may be some time for us to spend with God today, ask him to forgive us of our sin and to trust in his mercy and his grace and let him grow that faith in us. If you're here today and you've been around South Peoria for a while and you know this is the place you want to make your, your church home and you haven't joined yet, I'm going to encourage you to come down. This will be the time you come to join our church and get involved with our church. Make this the place where you call home and grow spiritually and serve the Lord. But church, whatever we do this moment, let's not leave here the same way that we've come in because we've come before the throne, we've opened the word of God, and let's spend time with our King today. Heavenly Father, God, we give you this moment and this morning. May it bring honor and glory to you, for you are good. You've given us a free gift that's so much better than anything we could ever earn on our own. And we worship you in spirit and truth this morning as our King, our Creator, and our Savior. For you are good. In your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand as we continue to worship God. He will. 
Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. ability that we come to you and that we hold on to you but father that you draw us into you and you hold on to us Jesus we recognize that the only way to be saved is through faith faith alone and God if we believe that it is by our works Lord that is a false gospel and that is what mankind truly thinks will save them Lord but it says in scripture it is by faith alone so God I pray that even as we continue to worship you through singing that we understand that you are good and in your loving kindness and in your grace and mercy you have given us the gift of faith to put our trust in only you in Jesus name we pray was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had I would refuse you still, but as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross, and I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered
if you're a guest with us today. We're glad you're here this morning. Um, every week we have an opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings. And this is something we do as a church, as a, as a Christian. We give not out of obligation, but it's an act of worship. Just as we sing, just as we hear God's word preach, we give. And that's how we worship God. So we're going to take a moment and pray for our tithes and our offerings. Lord, we thank you for each and everything you have done. And God, we thank you that you have saved us, and you have rescued us, and you have forgiven us. Each and every one of us who have fallen short of your glory, God, who stumble and sin each day, Lord, we find grace in you. And because of the faith you have given us, God, we know that we can trust you fully. So as we give our tithes and offerings, we pray that we give with a heart that is excited about what you're doing in us and through us. May you take this offering and, and these tithes, Lord, and multiply them so many people can hear that it is by faith alone they can be saved. All glory to you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We're putting these ladies on the spot here today with the question, what do you enjoy doing with your friends? Oh my gosh. Shopping. Eat, shopping, <laughs> eating. We're in, eating. I'm in Marilyn's Bible now. class and we love to eat. I love to play board games and drink coffee and watch movies. Play hide and seek. I go to the movies. I love to go to the movies. I would say just going out to eat and just spending time with them. Go to the native grill and have wings. And, oh, let's see, I got my Tuesday night Bible study and all my girlfriends are there, so I love that. Katie, tell us what's one of your favorite things to do with your friends. Friends? I don't really have any friends. I'm pretty lame. I have no friends. I have uh, a family I spend a lot of time with and two little ones that consume a lot of my time. I don't have friends. Just my family. We go out, have dinner spend time together. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I don't have a lot of friends outside of my church family and stuff. Oh. Hey, Christine. All right, Riley, what's one of your favorite things to do with your friends? To play them. Uh, just mess around and be ourselves. I enjoy spending time with my friends, whatever is going on, just time together. That's my favorite thing to do because whenever we get together, we're smiling, we're laughing, we listen to each other and Anything becomes fun doing it with a friend. So church, this Saturday is the Carried Women's Event. So please make sure, uh, I know some of you have vocalized that you've been praying for it. Please make sure you're there. Uh, so and invite the women that are around you. I know with us, we're inviting neighbors, family, friends, invite women to this event. It's going to be a great day, and it's going to be here. So you're not going to get lost trying to find some conference you don't know where it's at. It's going to be here in this building. So we're going to go ahead. Let's take a moment. I would like to pray for that event uh, this Saturday. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this Saturday. We look forward to what you're going to do, uh, even just in this building, Lord. We pray that this building is filled with women 
some that know you, God, and some that are distant and cold towards you. We pray for the hearts of the women that are going to come, that they will truly sense your spirit and hear your word, God, in such a mighty way that they may be transformed and learn, Jesus, that you have carried them. And God, just as when we receive your love, we are able to love others. When we receive your forgiveness, we're able to forgive others. And God, when we know we are carried by you, we can help carry others to you. So Lord, I pray that your spirit just shows up in a mighty way on Saturday. And we look forward to what you're going to do here, even in this building. May we celebrate even beforehand and may we praise you after for you are good all the time. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. If you'll stand with us, church, as we close with one last song. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, yes, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done. And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you be a real people who live to lead others to find life in Christ. We'll see you next week, church.